So welcome everyone to the August Cinegrid Community Forum. Uh, these are monthly sessions uh, online at the intersection of media and AI. And uh, since February, we've had uh, a number of really wonderful presentations by our illustrious speakers. Sorry. And um, uh, as Jeff said, we're recording this session. Uh, actually, all the sessions since February, we've recorded and we have them available online. They're actually posted to the Cinegrid channel on YouTube. And the uh, slides from the sessions are also available. And I will uh, send a URL for those uh, assets uh, in the chat uh, during uh, the talk today. So you're welcome to go back and, and look at them over. Look them over. Uh, we have a full program going forward through the end of the year, uh, uh, September 2021, uh, through Louise Ledeen's uh, hard work over many months, we've been able to convince the founders of uh, uh, Algosoft Tech USA uh, to talk about the work they're doing with film restoration using AI and deep learning at very high precision. Uh, in October, uh, our longtime collaborator and Cinegrid uh, gadget guy, Greg Harper, has agreed to give a talk about next generation remote collaboration, distance learning, and hybrid workplaces with a particular focus on the human factors and the skillful use of audio video technology to solve some of those human centric issues. And then December and November, we will not have a session because of Thanksgiving and supercomputing and other things. And so on December 7th and 8th, we'll have our last uh, meeting of the year. Uh, Brian Hansen, uh, one of Jeff uh, Weekly's uh, colleagues at uh, UC Santa Cruz, a member of the faculty at the Creative Coding Lab. Uh, Brian Hansen will give us a talk about AI generated sound effects for gaming and movies. So hope you can make them. Um, as always, they're free and everybody is welcome. Uh, uh, today, this is the agenda, very simple. I'm in the introduction part right now. We're going to have a talk by Alvy Ray Smith as, uh, uh, on his new book, A Biography of the Pixel. Please hold questions until the end. And uh, we have, uh, yesterday when we did this, we had a lot of really interesting and friendly discussion and I hope we do today as well. Uh, just before we uh, uh, officially end at uh, 1130, we will do a book raffle. We will raffle one of Alvi's new books to people who are here. You have to be present to win. Um, and Alvi's agreed to sign the books. And um, uh, Natalie will send them out to people who win. Uh, we're going to uh, officially end the session at 1130, but uh, we can stay around longer. Uh, for free discussion if people want to. And so uh, with no further ado, I'm, it's my honor to introduce Alvy Ray Smith, my long friend and colleague. Uh, he co-founded Pixar and Altamira Software. He was the first director of computer graphics at Lucasfilm and the first graphics fellow at Microsoft. He's received two Technical Academy Awards for his contribution to digital motion picture technology. Alvy Ray Smith, you're on. Hello, everybody. Let me get going here. There we go. Everybody can see that? Yes. OK. So if, if everyone would please mute their microphones while Alvy is presenting. Thank you. Let me begin by expressing my appreciation to our chairman, Lauren Hare, who has been my longtime friend and uh, has been through many battles with me over the years and has been a reader of many parts of this book during the, its 10 years of gestation. So uh, thanks, Lauren. Your name's going to pop up again, I think, in a place or two. <laughs> um, I have about you know, billions of pixels in this cell phone. And I bet in my cell phone, I bet you do in yours too. Uh, starting in about 2000, the year 2000, not that long ago, 20 years ago, 
something amazing happened. All old analog media converged into a single medium, the digital medium. The result is that nearly all pictures in the world are now digital. And in fact, because of the digital explosion, nearly all pic uh, pictures that have ever existed are digital. I call this class of pictures digital light. And that includes any picture made of pixels for, for whatever reason. So all of image processing, all of computer graphics, all of virtual reality, all of games, and so forth and so on. The, my Tesla dashboard is my most recent. Well, Zoom, all this Zoom, of course, is part of is part of, of digital light. It's uh, and yet the strange thing about a technology based on pixels is most people don't seem to know what pixels are. I get all sorts of strange answers to that you know, when I ask people what what a pixel is. Uh, the most uh, or if they have, or if somebody offers an explanation, it's it's wrong. A very common one is this, represented by this picture. Uh, I went out to Google, entered the word pixel, and clicked on images. And this is just some of the set of pix pictures that I found under Google, Google images for the word pixel. Most people, I'd say, most people think this is what pixels look like. but I want to say as loudly and clearly as I can, these are not pixels. Pixels have never been little squares. And so later on, I'd, after I've said a few things about what pixels actually are, I'll come back to where did this myth come from? It's really burned into our brains. All right. My book begins with the very beginning, namely with Joseph Fourier in the about the time of the French Revolution. So the late at the, in the late 1700s, 1789 or something like that. Uh, this is a picture of him. This is his official. He was actually pretty fat. So this is a very nice picture of him uh, made to make him look kind of nice. Uh, what Fourier, so it's one of those CP Snow two cultures things about whether you recognize Fourier or not. Or at least that's my experience when I talk to, to audiences Show of hands, everybody in the sciences, the technologies knows Fourier, by name at least. Hardly anybody in the uh, arts and humanities knows Fourier. One time an artist raised her hand and said, oh, she knew Fourier. And I said, you do? And she says, yeah, well, my husband was a Nobel laureate in physics. I went, oh, okay. So he talked about Fourier. That's okay. Uh, and that's, that's, that's unfortunate because Fourier's theorem is one of the most beautiful things uh, that was ever proved. And uh, the, basically the whole modern world is based on it at some level. Many of us probably used his theorem you know, daily. All right. And, and, the, and the story of the pixel is based ultimately on Fourier's uh, lovely theorem, which is the world. I, I strip away all the mathematics, which I think is why people don't know about these theorems, is they're, they're hidden under this obfuscation of mathematics. So I'm trying to strip away that in this book so that a layperson can understand the real beauty that's here. Fourier said, the sound is composed of sums of these kind of waves. Now, mathematicians call those sine waves, but in my uh, desire not to use any math in the book, I don't even call them sine waves. I've just said they're waves and they look like this. We all know this shape. Uh, they All waves look the same except by how fast they wiggle, which is the frequency, or how high the wave crests, which is its amplitude. So I think most people understand that music is simultaneous sound waves at different frequencies and different amplitudes. But Fourier went further and said, all sound is a sum of sound waves. And for example, here's the word, the English word yes in frequencies versus time going to the right. Uh, out at the right, the hiss, the, the S, the sound in yes is the highest frequency, as you can see. Fourier went further and he said, okay, we can pull, for, before, I, before I go on, leaping off into the theory, let me tell you a few things. One of the things, even though science and scientists and technologists all recognize the name Fourier, it's also my experience that not, nobody knows him. They don't know a thing about Joseph Fourier himself. 
for example. So let me say a few words about him. He was a French revolutionary in the French Revolution. And he came afoul of Robespierre, who was the czar of the French terror. And he himself, in the way that the French Revolution had a way of eating its own young, got thrown into prison to die by the guillotine. Lucky for our, for our man Joseph Fourier, Robespierre lost his head instead 10 days before Fourier was supposed to lose his. Freeing him to run off next with his new buddy, Napoleon Bonaparte, to Egypt. And he was in Egypt with the group that discovered the Rosetta Stone. And uh, let's, basically, Egyptology began with Fourier, and Fourier had a student that he mentored named Champignon who cracked the hieroglyphs using the Rosetta Stone. This is later in life. But Fourier saw Napoleon's military failures in, in Egypt. And the last thing Napoleon wanted was this blabbermouth guy, Fourier, in Paris telling people what he had seen happen in, in Egypt. So he did this clever thing. Napoleon did this clever thing. He made Fourier the governor of a province where, at, cap, where, whose capital was in Grenoble couple of hundred miles, I think, from Paris. And in those days, that was essentially, that essentially meant Fourier was in exile and he knew it. And in fact, he was never allowed back into Paris until uh, Napoleon himself got exiled finally to St. Helena, at which point he became head of the French Academy. And what you're looking at here is his, his official French Academy portrait. All right, let's get back to him. I mean, he's a fascinating person. I've only given you a slight glimpse of him. Uh, that's chapter one of the book. He said, if you extrude these, these waves out of the plane towards yourself, you get corrugations, which you can see by looking at the edge. It's, the edge is a one-dimensional wave. In fact, any cross-section of a corrugation is a one-dimensional wave. Fourier says, you can, if you have a two-dimensional signal, you can add these together and get, well, well first of all, let's, let's come up and take a bird's eye view of those corrugations to get to see them this way. This is the equivalent of the preceding slide. Different, they're all waves, two dimensional waves, different amplitudes and different frequencies. So Fourier's point was you can add these together to get any picture. So of your child, for example. And uh, this is my chance to show my child. My child Sam. <laughs> this is back. This is many decades ago. However, when Re Revenge of the Jedi had not been renamed Return of the Jedi, or this silly picture of Napoleon. Now, Napoleon, you can see, is, my book makes a big deal out of the role of tyrants in the in the developments of technology. Uh, Napoleon was the was the obvious tyrant for uh, uh, Fourier creating a space for him. It was exile, but it was also a quiet space in, in Grenoble where uh, Fourier was able to develop his, his uh, famous theorem that we're all talking about today. But another reason I have this picture up here is because it's an example, one of the last examples of the old, of, of the, bat, the, the days when we could not conceive of separating a picture from its media, from its medium, the oil, the canvas, the painting, the picture here uh, by Jacques-Louis David. It, nobody would even think of separating the picture from, from the medium. But basically what the pixel and digital light has let us do is to make that separation. We can now remove the picture from the medium. All right, on the shoulders, and here we get to the important part of what a pixel is. On the shoulders of Fourier comes this guy. He's a Russian named Vladimir Kotelnikov, Kotelnikov. He comes from a long line of prestigious mathematicians in Russia, all the way back to his great, great, great grandfather, who was a student, one of the six students of the great, one of the greatest mathematicians of all times, Euler. And 
he that original Kotelnikov was a member of the original Russian Academy of Sciences founded by Peter the Great. So this guy, even though he's a Russian and he's a communist, is no slouch as a mathematician. I, you know, when I first heard about him, by the way, what I'm going to claim is that he is the person who gave us the sampling theorem on which the pixel is based. I'll explain that in a moment. But in America, we were all taught that Claude Shannon did that. So one of my surprises in writing the book was to discover that no, Claude Shannon did not prove the sampling theorem. In fact, he never even claimed he did. He just said, it's in the air. So he either didn't know about Kotelnikov's 15 year earlier result, or because of the Cold War and all the secrecy involved, he wasn't about to say anything about a Russian communist having done it. Both Shannon and Kotelnikov were in the crypt cryptographic secret world of coding and, and uh, so forth during the, the war, the Cold War. So in 1933, this guy, Kotelnikov, published this paper. Uh, I don't read Russian, but I can read the mathematics. And the mathematics is the sampling theorem, which I'll say more about in a moment exactly as I use it today, including its nuances, low pass and band pass, if you speak those words. Uh, but before we go off into the beautiful theorem, theorem, the sampling theorem that he proved, let me just tell you some more about this amazing man. He lived through the entire Soviet nightmare. He was born before the revolution. He lived through World War I, the Russian Revolution, the Civil War afterwards, World War II, and the Cold War. He was essentially head of the, not only the chief cryptographer for the Soviet Union, but he also led well, was one of the leaders of the space space race from the Soviet side. Uh, the last picture I have of him, I found on Vladimir Putin's website. He's standing. This is 2003. Kotelnikov. Is, is sporting all the merit badges of the Soviet Union, orders of Lenin, orders of Stalin, and so forth. This is the 70th anniversary of that paper at the top of the slide being published. Uh, he's being, it, it's, it's sometimes translated as knighted. I don't, you know, I'm sure it's not, there's no knighthood in, in Russia, but it's a very rare honor, some order of, to, to the memory of the motherhood or something like that. And he's like the fourth recipient ever of this very high award. And I might also add that the last job that this, our guy had in the Soviet Union was for eight years. For eight years, he was chairman of the Supreme Soviet of Russia. Just everything about this guy's a surprise. I might also add that he came to America in 1956. I think I'm the person who discovered this. He came to America in 1956 and told us about Sputnik. He said, we're going to put up a satellite in a couple of months. Maybe, I think it was 1957, actually. We're going to put up a satellite in a couple of months, and it's going to broadcast at these two frequencies. And that's exactly what happened. Nobody believed him. He was protected from the gulag. Most scientists of any uh, stature at all during the Stalin years got thrown into the special prisons called Sharaskas. Uh, uh, Solzhenitsyn told us about this. He did not have to go into the prisons because he had a protectress named Valeria Golapsova, who could protect our guy because she, her family was a close, were close family friends of Lenin, and she was married to Malenkov. I had to learn a lot of Soviet history. Malenkov was the bloody henchman of Stalin who took over as premier of Soviet, Soviet Russia when Stalin died. That was this guy's protector protectress. What? Oh, oh, please remember this shape. We're going to call it a spreader. We're going to talk about it quite a bit. All right. What is this theorem? By the way, every country claims to have the, the, the originator of this theorem. And I sort through all the details in my book and the online annotations. There are 300 more pages online, by the way. Consider this uh, the sound, the signal here, uh, let's, let's call it a, a, a sound. Uh, time proceeds to the right. It's the amplitude of a sound wave. And the straight line is zero loudness, zero amplitude. 
the sampling theorem, Kotelnikov taught us that if you pick out in a certain way equally spaced points along that signal, you can do the following remarkable thing. You can throw away all the points on the signal between the dots, the dots we call samples. What a surprise. You can throw away an infinity of information, it appears to say, between each pair of dots and not lose anything. Apparently not lose anything. When the signal is two-dimensional and is a picture, we call samples pixels. That's the definition of a pixel. First thing I want to point out is a sample is a value taken at a point. And we all know that points are zero dimensional. You can't see them. You cannot see a pixel. So we've got to, we've got to understand what it is we're looking at when we look at a display. Now, I just want to remind you, when I said I had billions there, you can't see them, right? Billions. They're in files. Can't see them. Uh, the condition at which this magic happens is depends on Fourier, and I'll just mention it. That signal at the top, according to Fourier, is a sum of Fourier waves. Kotelnikov says, find the Fourier wave of the highest frequency in that sum and sample at twice, actually just slightly greater than twice that frequency. I claim this is that, 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 that wave of highest frequency because there's nothing that wiggles in the original signal any faster. All right, that's half of the theorem. The other half is, okay, 10 years later in China, you've got the samples. How do you get the original signal they represent back? Well, remember this shape? It's called the spreader. And the first thing I have to do is say, whoops, we can't use this exact ideal spreader because it, those wiggles go off to infinity in both directions. In other words, this spreader, the ideal one, is infinitely wide and therefore not usable in the real world. So we, we're going to replace it right away with an approximation that's a finite width. You notice it's got the same central hump and a negative couple of negative lobes, but it goes to zero in a short width. All right. It's an approximation, but it's a pretty good one. And it, OK, enough said. What Kotelnikov sampling theorem says is put one of those spreaders at each sample. In other words, spread each sample is the way I say it. Spread each sample, put a spreader at the sample, adjust its height so it has the same height as the sample did, and then add up the results. That bold line at the top is the original signal the all, with all its infinite continuity of values has been restored. That's the magic of the sampling theorem. All right, now let's go into 2D because that's what we're really talking about. That's, that's 1D. This is what that spreader function looks like for pictures. It's a little mountain. If we drop a guillotine down through the peak of that mountain, you can see that the bleeding edge is that same shape, the hump with the two negative lobes going off to either side. In fact, this is a picture of a single sample, a pixel in other words, being spread by the spreader. So what in the case of devices does the spreading? And here's the part I think that loses most people. When I want to see a picture that's stored in a file in this device, I you know click on its name or whatever, and boom, suddenly it's there. It lights up the screen. And you see what you see are little glowy spots in an array, little soft glowy spots that form a continuous surface. Those little soft glowy spots that form your display are the spreader function for that device. They're approximations to the ideal spreader, but they are the spreader. So it's a, a lot of people call those soft glowy spots on their display screen pixels. No, they're not pixels, they're spread pixels. 
they they are the spreaders and the for you you could tell that pixels and and spread pixels are completely different things uh pixels are discrete zero dimensional separate spiky things the the array of soft glowy things on the your display well each one of them is soft it's analog it's uh, overlaps the the nearby soft glowy things i call them display elements in the book the, the point is that display elements and pixels are separate they're different kinds altogether to confuse those two things is a major mistake of the modern world in my opinion all right have i mentioned a little square even once here no there are no little squares in the sampling theorem you can you can force that mountain into the shape of a square if you want to but it's a gross it's a gross misrepresentation of what what the little spreader should look like so let's so why does so why does the world why do so many people think of pixels as those little pixelations of, of a screen i think i can answer that pretty strongly the following way i made that with photoshop i made this picture of 14 gray pixels so what you're looking at are those pixels actually those spread pixels because you can see this you can barely see them so what do you do with your with your device or your app in order to see something up close you zoom you, there's nearly always a feature called zoom so if we were to zoom in on this picture we would see this but i just want to point out that when you zoom it's a lie all that all that zoom this feature should be done away with it's it's a lie and it never was true what this feature does is take each pixel and say we want to magnify by 20 it replicates each pixel 20 times horizontally and then takes each of those rows and replicates it 20 times vertically in other words each pixel gets re gets represented as a square array 20 by 20 array of pixels of the same color and when you spread a square array of the same color of pixels what do you see what a surprise you see a square but it's not a picture that's not a picture of this up close now there is a way using the sampling theorem to blow this up by a factor of 20 accurately and this is what you get you can think of each one of those spots as the little mountain I showed you earlier as seen from above. And they overlap, they're soft and so forth. If you wanna give a pixel a shape, and I encourage you not to because they don't have shape, it's, it's, it, it's a soft glowy spread pixel that you should think of, not never a little square. All right. The third technology that is, that's important, uh, in my part of digital light, which is digital movies. And by the way, I kind of concentrate on the story of digital movies in my book because I know it well. And the arc of the story of digital movies happens to include the histories of most every other part of digital light. Uh, it's a good thing to hang all the other stories from, but we need the computer. So where did computers come from? I thought, you know, I was born before computers. It seemed to me like I should know the history of computers. I didn't. I couldn't. When I started this book, I couldn't tell you what the first computer was. And after thinking about it for a while, I realized it's because it's not well defined. So when I say computer here, I mean exactly stored program computer. If it's not programmable, it's not computer, not a computer. And I usually add the word electronic too, because the whole purpose of a computer is to be very fast and electronic assures that. So who invented the computer? Well, it was Alan Turing. I think most people understand that Alan Turing invented computation, but he also invented the stored program computer. And I try to make that clear in the chapter three of my book by stepping through his famous proof. Uh, well, a famous, a very famous proof Due to this man alone, this is a case of pure genius. Uh, he not only invented computation, but he invented the stored program computer in order to, to establish the field. The only other genius at the time who completely understood what this genius had done was John von Neumann. So I have 
you know, a lot of people think it was uh, von Neumann who actually came up with the stored program concept. No, he came up, he and his colleagues came up with an architecture that many of the early computers use, the von Neumann architecture. But it was because he understood exactly what, what uh, Turing had done. So let me leap to this slide. Pay no attention to the detail. Uh, I just want, this is a, a device I use several, several times in my book to try to capture the true history of a field. Uh, the, I, I make quite a point out of, if you ever hear a history of high technology that says it all started with a single creative genius, if, it's just not gonna be true. Uh, I use a, instead of using simple narrative, I use a genealogical approach. Uh, here's what I mean by that. This is a family tree of all the people and ideas and machines that work together to bring us the computer. Uh, sure, sure enough, there's Alan Turing and von Neumann at the top. Uh, the, in fact, uh, Alan Turing's paper on computable numbers is the establishing document of computers in the world. But you'll see there's no straight line to say whirlwind through this, through this family tree. This shows how people interacted with one another, who worked on what. Uh, let me just say one thing. About halfway down the chart, you see Pilot Ace, Baby, EdSec, ENIAC Plus, Zephyr, and Whirlwind Minus. Those are some of the fir first computers in the world. Uh, only one of them is not von Neumann architecture. And that's the one straight down from Alan Turing, the Pilot Ace. Unfortunately, one of the failures in Alan Turing's life was he did not get to build the first computer the first electronic computer, even though he tried at it. So I'm only gonna pick out two of these computers today. One, of, uh, one is Baby and the other one is Whirlwind at MIT. Baby is in Manchester, England. Okay, so for this book, I went to Manchester to see Baby. By the way, the first computer was named Baby. The first computer in the world, believe it or not, was named Baby. It was built at and I want to remind you by computer, I mean stored program computer. ENIAC wasn't stored program, it doesn't count. Colossus was even earlier, it wasn't stored program, it doesn't count. An adding machine built in Iowa made of vacuum tubes is not a computer, it doesn't count. And I think the historians, I've spoken to many historians now, and I think that the, the, the consensus is finally reaching the point where baby is acknowledged as the first, there is, a, there is a contender that I talk about in the book, but the reason I emphasize baby is because it had the first pixels. The first computer had the first pixels, much to my surprise. When I visited, this was on the screen, this was on baby's screen, Manchester, England, the word Pixar was scrolling to the right. Much to my amazement, the first programmable computer in the world had pixels and it could animate. Not that anybody at the time did animation, but basically the engineers that I talked to from that era were embarrassed by pictures. It was frivolous. It was forbidden to make pictures. Luckily, the first picture was photographed. Tom Kilburn, who was one of the people who built Baby, actually took a picture of the first digital image. This is it. You'll notice there are no little squares in even the original picture. Um, it's not very exciting, but there it is. 1948, 1947, actually. It was made slightly before Baby was completed in 1948. Then I, once I realized how early the pic, digital light had begun, I started poking around in other places looking for pictures. And I found the first interactive electronic game video game. Here it is, Checkers by Christopher Strachey, also at Manchester, on the machine, the grandchild of Baby. And then, so that was 51. In 53, I found this game called Tic-Tac-Toe on the EDSAC computer in Cambridge, England. Interactive, by the way. You know, let me emphasize that word. And the reason I'm emphasizing it is because my received version of the history of computer graphics was roughly Ivan Sutherland built Sketchpad in, six, in the 60s at MIT, and it was the first interactive computer graphics program, and all the world of computer graphics descended from there. 
that's just obviously not right. So I had to spend quite a bit of time and research it to figure out what the true story was. The other computer I wanted, the early computer I want to emphasize is Whirlwind at MIT. This was the first early computer where the people made pictures on purpose. They weren't embarrassed by pictures. Uh, and I spent a wonderful day in the archives in the Bedford, Mass at MITRE Corporation going and just finding, oh, so that's a first and that's a first, like this is the first surfaces. And this is a first, it's claimed to be a game, but I don't think it was. It claimed to be an animation, but I don't think it was. But this for sure was the first animation that I verified. 1951, an animation that actually was shown on Edward R. Murrow's See It Now television program in 51. And Alvi, this is a 30 minute time mark. Thank you. Let me calibrate here. All right. Uh, Yes, I'm about halfway through. That's good. <laughs> uh, so this is another one of those uh, genealogy or family trees. This connects to the last one I showed you um, with this whirlwind block, which is shared. So whirlwind was at the bottom of the last chart. It's at the top of this chart. So this is a continuation of that chart. Again, there's just way too much information here to talk about today. It's all in the book, though. Um, I do want, I'm going to talk about these three guys, but before I go there, would you look at the upper right, the save from the Nazis part? Um, this is kind of a surprise to me. My first chairman, my first boss out of, of Stanford Graduate School was Herbert Freeman. And he was one of the earliest computer graphics people in the world which I only kind of vaguely knew about. And he tried to seduce me into computer graphics early, knowing that I was an artist who painted on canvas, oils and acrylics. And I said to him, Herb, if you ever get color, I'll be interested because you haven't seen color yet, right? It's all been black and white. Herb had been saved from the Nazis as a child by Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein wrote three letters that have saved the child, Herb Freeman, from the Nazis. And the other say from the Nazi story that I just just amazes me is Marcelli Wine to the right there from uh, was born in Poland, was in the Warsaw Ghetto. He, as his father was being marched out of the Warsaw Ghetto to Auschwitz, he tossed his child off into the crowd and a, a, a Catholic woman raised Marcelli until he was old enough to be reuni reunited with his father. His father had survived Auschwitz. How did he do that? Well, he was a master tailor. He was number five on Schindler's list. Great story. Okay, back to these three guys. Here's a picture. Ivan Sutherland, Tim Johnson, Larry Roberts. And here are their pictures in that same order, left to right. Ivan Sutherland, even though I diminish him slightly in my book, he's still one of the huge players of this field, no question about it. But a person who... The other two have never been given, and he's been, and Ivan's been honored by, by uh, the computer graphics uh, world many times. The other two have not, and I'd like to try to start correcting that. Um, the guy in the center wrote, so Ivan wrote Sketchpad in 62 MIT. All these three guys are classmates at MIT in the early 60s, and they're all working on a huge computer called TX. Two. Uh, much to my surprise, when I discovered the sketchpad was only 2D. I don't know why I didn't know that. I just didn't know. I thought it was 3D, but it wasn't. The guy who wrote the 3D, first 3D interactive program, was the guy in the center, Tim Johnson. Now, if you'll look at their pictures, poor Tim looks so much like Ivan Sutherland that when you go out on the internet and look up Ivan Sutherland, so type Ivan Sutherland into Google and look at images. I did this recently, and 60% of the pictures were not of Ivan Sutherland. They were of Tim Johnson, and they weren't of Sketchpad. They were of Sketchpad 3, which was Tim Johnson's program. Sketchpad 3 was not version 3. It was the 3D version of Sketchpad. Not only was it 3D interactive, but it had perspective. The perspective was contributed by the third guy, Larry Roberts, uh, it's it's the form of perspective 
and four by four matrices, if that means anything to you, that we still use in computer graphics. Um, I put a I put the following terms on this. We in computer graphics have, without saying so, adopted the central dogma that we will build models in Euclidean geometry inside our computers and display them in two dimensions uh, using Renaissance perspective. These two guys did exactly that. And by the way, five years later, Ivan built the head mounted display, which is sort of, which you can credit with the beginnings of virtual reality or augmented reality. And at that point, he incorporated the central dogma. He had uh, perspective and 3D. Um, That brings us to what well, so far I've been talking about epic one of the history of computers and hence of digital light since they grew up together. You see baby 1948. This is the era of dinosaur machines that got bigger and bigger and bigger and they were kind of stupid. Then suddenly in 1965, Gordon Moore announced just, a, just an observation that he had picked up in building integrated circuit chips. Uh, the phenomenon known as Moore's law. And he expressed it as the density of chip components on an integrated circuit chip will double every year and a half or so. I find that unintuitive, so I converted it to an intuitive form that's equivalent. Uh, everything good about computers gets 10 times better, an order of magnitude better every five years. Everything you know, everything good about computers is the small size, the speed, the cheap, how cheap it is, and so forth. All everything good varies directly with the density, so that goes through. Uh, I use the word order of magnitude, the phrase order of magnitude, instead of factor of ten, because it it captures a, a limit of us puny human beings. We can only think about a factor of ten beyond where we currently are, and then we lose it. We just, we can't imagine by beyond one order of magnitude or very few of us can. My observation is if you can, you can probably become a billionaire. Uh, in order to handle a new order of magnitude, we have to change our con concepts and get to the next stage. What Moore's law says, we're gonna have one of those order of magnitude conceptual leaps every five years starting in 65, and that's happened. In fact, right now, the Moore's Law Factor, which was one in 65 when I made my first graphic, by the way, is, is sitting at 100 billion right now. Everything good about computers now is 100 billion times better than it was in 65. Well, I can say the numbers, but you, you can't really understand that unless you've lived it. And by the same token, it's going to hit a trillion in just a few years. Try to imagine what that actually means. It, it's hard to do. So this is the next continuation of that family tree of the, at least the movie part of, of digital light. This is the Epic Two part. Uh, Ivan Sutherland and Herb Freeman at the top of this chart continue from the preceding chart. Uh, I'm going to talk in particular about uh, three digital movie powerhouses, Pixar, DreamWorks, and Blue Sky. But I want to start in this by talking about these three fellows first, because this is one of the surprise stories of the book to me, was that uh, we're, we're getting to the place where color is about to show up. Color shows up because of Moore's Law. Another thing I discovered, Rodney Rugelow and Bob Schumacher at the top brought us the color pixel. And Rodney Rugelow and Don Greenberg, who started the Cornell juggernaut, uh, were freshmen together at Cornell and shared a pup tent during freshman orientation. That turned into Don Greenberg being invited to use a machine that, that Ruggelo and Schumacher built and on which color graphics began at Cornell. 
but let's start with this picture. I went in search of the first color pixels and found them. This is on Rougelot and Schumacher built a simulator for the uh, Apollo moon project. And it had the first color pixels and not only that, but it had the first color renderings of computer graphics. 1967, much earlier than I had expected. All right, now I'm gonna start leaping ahead. Remember Moore's Law is starting to rip here. Ed Catmull's hand on the left and his classmate at Utah, Red Park's face in 72, these two guys kind of bicker about who was first, but basically they were classmates and did it simultaneously. Had uh, not color, but they had shaded movies in 72-ish. Same year though at Cornell, the Cornell students with Don Greenberg made a color movie called the Cornell movie. I thought I was, had been a, a user of the first color pixels in the early 70s. So this is way beyond when they actually happened at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, Xerox Park. And this is my, my late great friend's Dick Shop's program, Super Paint, where I got my start. Uh, really, because it was color pixels. Remember, I told her, I, when you get color, I'm in. Well, this is where the color happened. All right. The th thing that, you know, another thing I looked for in this book was when did anti-aliasing really happen? When did sampling theorem really start getting used correctly? Well, I believe it was my friend Dick Shelp, who in 73 did this rendering. You see the ugly wh wagon wheel on the left with the jaggies? He showed that it could be rendered on a on a 8-bit graphic system beautifully, as, as shown at the right. All right, now we're going to leap ahead. I got fired because uh, from Xerox Park because they decided not to do color. So I went, okay, bye, and went looking for the next color memory and found it with a crazy man at this place called the New York Institute of Technology. Just to show you how fabulous this place, it's on the, was, is, it's on the North Shore of Long Island, Great Gatsby Land, there are estates and mansions everywhere. This was our video mansion on the New York Tech campus. Uh, it's called the DeSaversky House, named for this fellow, Alexander DeSaversky, who is uh, another Russian who shows up in my book. He was born an aristocrat, got kicked out in the Russian Revolution, came to America, started Republic Aviation, became extremely wealthy, and wrote a book called Victory Through Air Power. Walt Disney, oh, which inspired the creation of the U.S. Air Force. Walt Disney turned this book into a propaganda movie, Disney's propaganda movie for the war effort. And was so Disney and this fellow were close personal friends. And the other Alexander is Alexander Schur, who was my patron at New York Institute of Technology. He was the president of New York Tech. He named this mansion for his his good friend, uh, uh, Saversky. The one part of the book that I just, the one part of the history I just could not nail was how did these two very different guys meet and do business together? But they did. And I'm pretty sure it's uh, Saversky's friendship with Disney that is, caused Alexander Schur, the guy on the right, to think he was the next Disney. Because when we arrived there, he was working on an animated movie called Tubby the Tuba of the old fashioned cell, cell, cell animation variety. The one thing this crazy guy did was he bought us the first 24 bit pixel memory in the world for $80,000. Well, first of all, he bought us the first eight bit, the second eight bit memory in the world for $80,000. And then he came to me one day and he said, what do we have to do, Al? We just stay ahead. And I said, well, if you buy me two more of these frame buffers, these 8-bit frame buffers or picture memories, uh, I can gang them together and make 24, a 24-bit 24 memory. And I tried to explain to him the difference between 256 colors and 16 million colors, not knowing if he fully understood it. But sure enough, a few weeks later, he showed up came back into the lab and said, well, I bought you five more of those eight bit thingies. So you would have two of those 24 bit thingies. <laughs> uh, I'm astonished today when I 
tell the story because basically in today's dollars, he said, I just spent 2 million bucks on your say so. And he put us way out in advance of the rest of the world. We had the first 24 bit color graphics in the world and we went crazy. This is just some of the art we created during this time. All right, but and, and some, one of the best things that happened to me while I was still at this place was I met the artist, Ed M. Schwiller. I'm the guy with the black hair in this picture, folks. Ed M. Schwiller was my mentor and we created this piece called Sunstone that I'm very, very proud of. It's in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. And it's, it's 3D, you know, computers were really slow still. So it was really hard to do 3D. In fact, we had to simplify the 3D to just planes. Uh, but this, this was an example, 1979 of 3D uh, color graphics, correctly anti-aliased in space, but not time and texture mapped and so forth. And then we finally figured out that Uncle Alex Schur, as we called him, was not, didn't have what it takes. So we had come up with the notion after watching these animators at, at, uh, at uh, New York Tech that we should be the first group in the world to make a digital movie. And that became our goal. And we also came to the conclusion that Alex Schur was not the guy. Toby the Tuba was a failure. And we left at this point, some of us did, to George Lucas's Lucasfilm. And uh, probably the story is pretty well known to, to most of you by now, but uh, George did not come and ask me to ask. The, so I started putting together this amazing group of geniuses to thinking that George Lucas wanted us in his movies. And he did not come and ask us, even though we had this great team, to be in his movies. And we only got our break at Lucasfilm when Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, producers came to us from Paramount Pictures and asked us to be in their movie. And we did the Genesis demo. And sure enough, when George saw that, it opened his eyes and he started uh, considering putting us in his movies. He put us in his next movie. And he told his buddy Steven Spielberg about us and the word started to spread. And we are on a 45 minute time mark. Okay. I'm going to wrap it up pretty fast then. Um, so that was 82. Star, uh, Star Trek was two. Genesis demo was 1982 at Lucasfilm. In 84, in 83, Ed Catmull and I were flying back from the SIGGRAPH, the big annual computer graphics conference. And we decided that at the 84 SIGGRAPH, one year hence, we would announce to the world that we did character animation, not not special effects, but character animation. That's what we both really loved and that's what we wanted to do. And uh, I started drawing right on that plane. I started drawing storyboards for what, for what became Andre and Wally B. And what saved us was, what saved me, I thought I was gonna be the animator, not yet understanding that I wasn't good enough. Uh, what saved me was hiring stumbling upon John Lasseter, this young, brilliant animator and hiring him. Uh, who, who basically made Andre and Wally be a success. But what I'm really showing you right here is the technological solution that we could come up with at the time of motion blur. This is four successive frames from Andre and Wally B to show that we had solved motion blur, which was absolutely crucial to our success ever being, our ever being successful in major motion pictures. And that same year, one of the resident geniuses at Lucasfilm, Tom Porter, created this piece, 1984, totally fake picture, but it showed, it demonstrated, I think, that we had mastered technologically everything we needed to master. I put it up here because it, I, I need to bring up the central dogma one more time. We've now added a new element to it, and that is not only are we uh, modeling in Euclidean geometry, but and 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 rendering in uh, renaissance perspective but we're we're rendering according we're coloring and shading according to newtonian physics i can't overemphasize that there's nothing about computers that dictates these three choices this is a this is a i call it a dogma because we just elected to use these these three restrictions it's a very rich set of restrictions i call it the symphonic form of modern computer graphics all current digital movies are made inside this dogma, 
But I want to emphasize that there's nothing about computers. To the artists, especially, I want to emphasize, please, steps outside the central dogma. There's no reason to be limited to that, that world. Um, this is where Lauren Carp, this is where Lauren Carp, this is where uh, Lauren shows up again. Lauren Hare shows up again. Uh, a Japanese company came to us at, in the last days of Lucasfilm and said, we, we, want you guys, we want to help you guys make the first movie in the world, the first digital movie. And it, it will be based on the Monkey King, a very classic set of stories known, known and loved by people in Asia. And I also was a fan of the Monkey King, so I love this idea. And uh, we started working on it. John Lester started doing character studies. We did story treatments and marketing treatments. And at some point I had to decide I had to come up with a number to charge this Japanese company. Uh, and much to my dismay, when I sat down, nobody had costed a full 3D movie before. So I sat down and went through the work and much to my dismay, I discovered that, oh no, Moore's Law has not arrived as I assumed it had. We needed another order of magnitude. We needed five more years. It was gonna to take too long to do Monkey and it was gonna to cost too much. We weren't there yet. Now, that was a good time to have come up with that piece of knowledge because George and Marshall Lucas got divorced about then and he could not, George could no longer support us in, in our group. So I said to Ed, let's start a company to give our world-class team of geniuses a home while we wait for Boris Law to pass, another, pass through another order of magnitude improvement. And he agreed, now this is two computer nerds talking to one another, we went across the street to a bookstore called a clean, well-lighted place for books and bought how to start company books. And the astonishing thing is that it worked, but it was really hard. We went through 45 funding opportunities that all failed. Uh, 35 VCs turned us down, 10 corporations turned us down. And finally, in a Hail Mary act, we, we called up Steve Jobs. Uh, and he became our venture capitalist. He did not buy Pixar, as is often reported by his version of things. He gave us the capitalization money that we used to buy our technology rights for the things we had developed at Pixar, at Lucasfilm. And he became our majority shareholder. The rest of the company was owned by the employees. And for five years, we, we suffered through being a hardware company that we were not, it was great hardware, but we were not a good hardware company, despite having a hardware guy like Steve Jobs as our majority shareholder. But Moore's Law passed during that five years and Disney came and knocked on our door and said, okay guys, let's make that movie. And we started, you know, right on schedule, by the way, right on Moore's Law schedule, the compute power hit, and we started working on Toy Story and came out in 95, which I round off to be the millennium. And right about the same time, DreamWorks came out with Ants and, and Blue Sky came out with Ice Age. And, and I say this is all at the millennium. So these were three very noticeable, very public, very noticeable flags waving in the in the wind bright bright flags waving saying the great digital convergence has occurred and it, my book is a celebration of that convergence and uh we are we are all living in the world established at that time so i think i'm going to stop oh one more thing since this is a uh centigrade group Darcy Gerbarg is a member of Cinegrid, and I want to just show a picture of hers uh, that I can address. Uh, I hope in the, in the my book stops in the in, at the year 2000. So what's happened since? Well, there's a lot of virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. She is an artist who has broken out of the central dogma, and this is one of her pieces that I include in the book, thanks to her. And I'm going to stop there and open it up to question and answer. I hope you have lots of questions for me. Well, thank you so much, Alvi. And uh, if uh, 
<clears throat> we're going to remove Alvi's spotlight, which Jeff has already done. And if you shift into gallery mode, you can see everybody. We have about yep. uh, 20 people on here. And um, uh, thank you, Alvi. Uh, it was even better the second time. I, did I re I've repeated a lot, I think, but I'm not sure. Of course, you're you're a polished uh, performer, you know, and uh, calling yeah. yourself a computer nerd is much too humble. So uh, we have uh, uh, lots of good time for discussion. Uh, some of you know Alvi uh, longer than I do, and some of you have never met him, but it may have heard of him. And um, uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to... Uh, just open your mics and uh, uh, shout out to Alvi, ask him whatever you want, uh, uh, or make a comment and, you know, tell it like it is. And uh, who wants to go first? Please just wave at me. I'll just throw in here that um, I remember meeting Alvi at the Cinegrid meeting in San Diego and I have never forgotten his speech, and I have used some of this stuff in my classes to teach my oh, great. students. And um, so I'm looking forward to actually getting a copy of the book and reading it. That's great, Bill. Thanks. Thank you, William. And uh, I remember your talk at Cinegrid Alvi, and uh, you know, you had the basic concepts already. But of course, you spent the last, I don't know, five, six years well, like actually researching it down to the, you know, first yeah, principle ground truth. <laughs> and packaging it. I, I remember you guys encouraged me to give that talk, and I didn't think I really had much to say until I did it. Realized, oh, I do have something to say, I think. <laughs> Who wants to talk next? Who wants to ask Alvi something or say something? I'd just like to say welcome uh, to Jeanne. It's so nice to see you. Welcome to Brazil. I mean, welcome from, from us to Brazil. Lovely to see you. And uh, one more comment and then I'll mute because I don't really have a question. William, I wonder if one of the things you was striking to you was the balance that Alvi emphasized that they maintained a Pixar between the looking at everyone as creative whether they were in engineering or in uh, uh, coming from the world of art or creative arts, that, that that creativity was equally important and equally valued and equally, more importantly, compensated. Um, so. Yeah, I'd like to say something about that. Yeah, go ahead, Alvi. Oh, okay. Uh, one of the things I'm most proud of, in fact, is that uh, culture that we set up, well, we, started at New York Tech, but it, it it became the Pixar culture, of course. And that was, we did not allow technical people to look down their noses at artistic people or vice versa. It was a mutual admiration society because we understood that both kinds of creativity were absolutely crucial to, what, to the success of what we were doing. And uh, that included, as Natalie said, equal pay and dignity and promotional possibilities and you know everything was the same there was no there was no distinction between whether you were technically creative or artistically creative and i make a big point of that in the book it's like it's, there there are these artificial i think they're artificial lines drawn between they're not lines they're hierarchies attempted hierarchies between types of creativity like uh theoretical Creativity is somehow supposed to be better than experimental creativity. Well, I, no, they're they're both required. Yes, the people involved are different, but to to establish a hierarchy is just self promoting, as far as I can tell. Tom, so uh, Dan Sandine, many many years ago, decades ago, was asked, um, "How do you tell the difference between the artists and characterize the difference between the artists and the programmers?" in our program in Chicago, uh, Donna and Maxine and everybody. Um, and we had uh, typically speaking about one third artists and two thirds computer science students. And Dan thought for many, he says, well, the programmers are better musicians. That's what he said, so. Which makes me think of Tom Duff was one of our geniuses at, uh, at all, all along New York Tech, Lucasfilm, Pixar. And my neighbor 
until recently here in Berkeley, who would throw for years has thrown a salon in his house for the most outrageous experimental music you can imagine. If any experimental musician comes to town, they have a they know they can come to Tom's place and there will be a small crowd, but enthusiastic crowd to hear music, but it's not music like you've ever heard anywhere else before. Well, I'm I'm uh, I'm see Dan Sandin is just logging back on, so I'm going to quickly use his name uh, and say that uh, uh, years ago, uh, uh, of course, Dan and Tom uh, and Maxine and Donna have created the Electronic Visualization Lab in Chicago, which was a cross discipline between art, the art department, and the computer science department, and. Uh, uh, I once asked Dan years ago, I think we were hiking in the woods that uh, what's the uh, what's the cross pollination that goes on between the artists and the engineers. And he said that uh, the artists teach the engineers all the unexpected ways their technology will be used or broken. So that the engineers can make better products. And the engineers learn from the artists what a true deadline is. Because when you're done with your artwork, you sign it and you hang it on the wall. An engineer says, oh, that's the version one. I'll, I'm already working on version two. And uh, that, that an engineer needs to learn that, you know, sometimes you have to sign it and hang it on the wall. So I always remember that, Dan, and uh, it's nice to see you've logged back in just in time to hear, hear your words echoed back at you. So one of my longest artistic collaborations was with David DeFrancisco. And we we came through Chicago really early and met this crazy pair, Tom and Dan. And we had these amazingly wonderful arguments about whether real time was going to be better than uh, 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 computational graphics. Uh, and we, and to make a further point of Dan's point, we, when we wrote software at New York Tech, we would hand it off to David DeFrancisco, who was uh, an artist by training. And if it was going to break, D David would figure out how to break it. If we design, nobody will ever use more than we might set a, a, a thousand line segments. Well, David would immediately sit down and use 10,000 line segments and break everything. So, yes, great for, great for debugging. Uh, who else uh, has a question for Alvi? Jeff Weekly. Uh, hi, Alvi. Um, hey, Jeff. Great talk um, again. Uh, so when I give um, uh, lectures to um, students, usually undergrads, about uh, graphics, I often start with sampling theory um, in in somewhat similar way as you do. Um, but I describe um, the sampling theory as Nyquist's sampling theory. And I, I think I might need some calibration there. Um, I, I, I started out there too. You know, I was raised, there was no computer science when I went through. So I was a, an electrical engineer. And I learned that it was Nyquist, Nyquist who did the sampling theorem. And then when digital came along, when I got to Stanford and, start, and there was a computer science department all of a sudden, suddenly it was Claude Shannon who was the digital version. Claude Shannon was a younger colleague at Bell Labs of Nyquist. So when I started doing my early research, I said, well, what's the story about why, why did we think it was Nyquist? Turns out Nyquist did prove a sampling theorem, but it's not the one that, we're, that we use. The, the contribution that's got his name and sort of sticks, whether he did it first or not, is the sampling at twice the highest frequency business that's often called the nyquist sampling fr uh frequency which is okay uh but he didn't i i look through thick by the way his name is not even nyquist that's all in the book that's that's all in the book <laughs> uh, he wasn't think, he wasn't born in the states either he was he was that's right that's 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 why his name is not nyquist it, when he when he when they uh they needed a name so they just chose the name Nyquist when they came to America. It means something like new name or something, as I recall. 
any other questions? Next question. Yeah, I have one, uh, Lauren. Go ahead, Howie. So, Alvi, you you broached on the subject of argumented or mixed reality in one of the recent talks you gave, and I'm kind of curious about what your your thinking or your thoughts are regarding that trajectory, where we're going, what's really exciting to you about it. Yeah, well, that's kind of what I'm watching, maybe more closely than almost anything else. Um, uh, virtual. So, first of all, I'm advising a little virtual reality startup company in the valley called baobab studios is making entertainment in virtual reality so they synthesize everything that you see augmented reality usually means you superimpose it's like uh the head mounted display that ivan sutherland did in 68 where you superimpose graphics onto a scanned in uh, uh background so you augment mixed reality the way i use the term anyhow is where you take an internal computer model, 3D, and you derive another 3D model from the scanned environment. This is the hard part. That's hard to do. And you mix those two models together so that objects in one of them cast shadows on objects in the other and trans, you know, uh, transparent objects in one are transparent to objects in the other and so forth. Mixing those two 3D models together is a hard problem. Uh, I suspect there's, you know, maybe uh, five or 10 years of cigarette papers buried in there, or maybe it's already been done. I'm having a hard time tracking all of this. Very interesting stuff. I showed you Darcy's uh, uh, painting there at the very end. She uses a tilt brush program, it's called, to paint strokes in uh, in three in virtual reality. So they you know, they have, they exist in 3D, they're texture mapped, they cast shadows, uh, they're lit, and all those nice 3D things. Then she takes that piece of 3D and uh, um, mixes it. I mean, it's a, she argues that it's a little bit of mixed reality, but it's very little. She augments scanned in, uh, uh, it's her studio often or inside her house she scans it in and takes it into photoshop and mixes the 3d virtual reality tilt brush stuff with what she scanned in you know the the tilt brush stuff is part of the central dogma but the scanned in stuff and then after it's been photoshopped we're, we're outside the central dogma all of a sudden and i find you know i've been following uh her paintings for decades she's been using paint programs for decades and I'm just suddenly drawn into her paintings now because of, I think it's that 3D-ness of the virtual stroking pulls me in. It's making, she's making an amazing set of pa paintings now. I, that's, that's the reason that's not full. It's, it's mixed reality in the sense that I've, I think the floor is shared in the models, but it, it's not a full sharing of full 3D models scanned in and created. Yeah, if I could just uh, follow up and direct the, the 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 process into things like the Unreal Engine and movie making. Oh, oh God, the Unreal. Yes. Uh, it, it's so back at Lucasfilm in the '80s, uh, Lauren Carpenter in particular came up with this number that we we needed to start thinking about. We, he came up with the number 80 million polygons per frame. We, our software could not break when we hit it with 80 million polygons. Now, this is the day when we're, people had typically 1,000 polygons in their picture. But you know, we're trying to think ahead about, okay, what, what? We can't have software that breaks when you throw 80 million polygons at it was the number he came up with. But, of course, we were ready to spend 30 to 50 hours to compute a frame that had 80 million polygons in it. Unreal Engine does it in real time, which, you know, I, I can look at Moore's Law Curve. That's what I was trying to say. I can look at Moore's Law Curve and tell you, oh, because of this order of magnitude multiplier, X years from now, from, look, from the 80s, we should be able to do this in real time. But when it actually happened, it's a mind blower. And I'm still trying to <laughs> trying to wrap my head around it. While, and, the, and the other aspect of, of Moore's Law is that you, people can't go backwards. The only way you can go backwards on Moore's Law is if you were there yourself. 
I was there. A lot, several of us were there. We can imagine what it was like a factor of 10,000 ago, but we shouldn't wish that on anybody. That was pretty awful. The, the, the youngsters today start at Moore's Law where it is now and go from there. It's amazing. I'm also... I'm also very much into AI. I've been, uh, I always have been. I, uh, I started at AI and when I came to graduate school in 65 to Stanford, it was to be an artificial intelligence. I had discovered this sexy term, artificial intelligence. I was in love with computers, even though they were incredibly pokey at the time, but I didn't know that. Uh, and I thought, oh, wow, does that sound so cool that we could understand how this works? by using the computer as a model. So uh, I, I got into Stanford and I learned Lisp from, from McCarthy and so forth. But after a couple of years, I went, nah, this is not gonna happen in my lifetime. And uh, which I might've been wrong about. Uh, I decided to change fields and do something like make the first digital movie that I could actually accomplish in my lifetime. But hey, that's now been done. Uh, I'm back and I've been tracking the AI all along and all of a sudden it's getting really interesting and I'm understanding now that I didn't understand well let me let me put it this way when Alison Gopnik is my wife she and I were in uh, on one of her sabbaticals in Cambridge England a couple of years ago and John Bronskill, who is an old pixel packer like me, worked on Photoshop filters for a lot of years, was working on his PhD at, at Cambridge, walked up to me and he said, hey, Alvy, we don't have to program anymore. And I went, what do you mean? He said, well, read this paper. And he handed me a paper. It happened to be from Berkeley, which is my school right up the street here, uh, from the AI guys at, at Berkeley. And it was horses and zebras paper, as I call it. Basically, they had trained, trained a GAN with a thousand pictures of horses, arbitrary horses and arbitrary arrangements, no text, just the pictures, and a thousand pictures of zebras. And when after they had trained this GAN, then they would give it a picture, an arbitrary picture of horses, and it would output the very same picture, except every horse had been replaced by a zebra or vice versa. And I looked at that and I went, how, how does that work? I don't even think that's a well-posed problem. And he said, we don't, we don't know. It just works. <laughs> and it's too hard to, to reverse engineer it to figure out what it's doing. And it, that's the point where I went, oh my God, I always thought I would understand. When, when we started approaching things that approach intelligence, I thought, stupidly now that I think about it, that I would be able to understand how it worked. And now I'm understanding, no, that's probably that's probably exactly what Alan Turing was trying to tell us. When you start computing on the engine itself, you get into spaces that you cannot predetermine. That's one of the most profound things that Turing gave us, by the way, and I spent a lot of time on that in the book because I think it's underappreciated. And I wonder if uh, someone else would like to say something. Uh, I would. Oh, please, Richard. Uh, yes. Hi, Richard. Um, hello, Alvy. <laughs> uh, loved your presentation. Thanks. And uh, I, I was very happy to see Rod Rugelo and Bob Schumacher uh, get the credit that uh, they deserve. Yeah, I figured how to weave all these guys together. I never understood before. That was, that was, that was great. I, I had the pleasure of working on their system, CT3, at uh, the NASA Johnson Space Center and met those guys and... Uh, Aren't they uh, wonderful? They, yeah, they are. They're wonderful. They're wonderful. Uh, but I had a question about Pixel. Um, and that is so, you know, we might think of a Pixel as, you know, well, these three numbers, um, you know, are infinitely small uh, in space. But I was wondering uh, if you have any thoughts about pixels in time, like are any three numbers a pixel or are they only a pixel if and when they are displayed or meant to be displayed? and are three numbers a pixel now and not later? Or... Oh, dear. Let's see. Wow. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure I know how to answer this question. Uh, well, I, I do. I definitely go off into the time dimension because I'm trying to explain how movies work in the book, which is another. Well, I started off my my movie chapter by believing it was a, you know, sound is a sound is an example of the sampling theorem. Pictures is a 
example of the sampling theorem. Movies are an example of sampling theory. And then I got to, into the details of how movies actually work and realized they may be, but that's not how movies are implemented, much to my surprise. Uh, I, I can't what wait you, to you guys. What do you mean by that, Alvi? Well, okay, so if, if you were to make a movie using the sampling theorem, you would figure out what the, what the highest frequency, temporal frequency is, then sample at twice that frequency to get your frame rate. Well, and, and, and you would project, you would, when it came to projection time, you would, you would um, spread your, your samples, which we call frames, you would spread your frames in time so that they overlapped the way Kotelnikov told us to do it, and then put the result into our eyes. But that's not what we do. We shoot the frames right directly into our retinas and our brains figure out from i think mostly from motion blur uh cues what the what the motion has to be it does the so the brain does the reconstruction that's not what i expect at all what amazes me is what amazes me is i don't think anybody ever built a sampling theorem movie movie system it's just sitting there to be done well, wouldn't just going to a higher frame rate uh, satisfy you? Satisfy no, because that just means the frames go into the go through the pupil into the retina at a higher rate. There's still the, the blackness between the two, you know uh, between them. The uh, a sampling theorem version would say reconstruct before going into the pupil, and there's it's easy to describe. I do it in the book. I say here's how it would work, but so far as I know, nobody's done it. Um, George? George. Yeah, I saw them, I get you. <laughs> well, first of all, great presentation, Alvi. I love Thank some you. of the details and the way you've woven together various things and people and the history and all that. So very cool. Thank you. And a wonderful explanation of why a pixel isn't a square. So thanks for that. But on related to what you were just saying, um, while not addressing everything you just mentioned, there's a guy named Tony Davis who had a company called Tessive, which was then acquired by Real D. And we talked been... about Tessive yesterday, actually. Okay. Yeah. What... yeah, so he's been addressing it... part of that. <clears throat> and of course, also digital projection gets rid of one piece of the problem with cinema. You, you need it, you know, when you're projecting film, you need it to leave time for the film to be dragged down to the next frame. So with digital projectors, you don't have that black time it can be on completely. And now you've got the option to do some temporal uh, filtering um, in is advance. It done? Is, it, is it done, George? That's what I want to know. Do the digital projectors do that? Well, they're still just normally being fed, uh, you know, 24 different pictures each second. So yeah, I don't think they're yeah. doing anything. But but Tony, the thing that Tony sort of turned into a, a real technique was to do some of that processing to eliminate some of the um, artifacting that you get from yeah, the wheel, the wheels going backwards. We talked about this actually the damn wheels keep, still go backwards. Yeah. Right? Uh, right. Garrett brought it up uh, as well, George. Oh, okay. Great minds think alike. No, I, I, I have not read the test of literature. Uh, Garrett just sent me the pointers yesterday, so I can't wait to go off and read it. Uh, now I have 300 pages of annotations, which I mentioned there online for my book where I can keep adding things as I discover them. So as I understand how Tessive works, I'll probably add some annotations to that effect. So basically, what, to, to make it work well is you use a camera that can shoot at 120 frames a second with a 360 degree shutter angle, meaning the, the shutter is never closed and you get those samples and then you do a temporal uh, resampling, filtering resampling, and then you can sort of simulate not a, you know, whereas real film has a square wave in time. Yeah, this you can do that, yeah. yeah. Overlapping. Okay, wave. there it is. I Somebody has done it, it sounds like. So that's that's good. Of course, it those makes of us, sense that nobody had done this, yeah. Those of us who grew up on TV, you know, uh, don't believe any of that. Help me, so. What are you saying? Well, we didn't have, Tom? Well, we didn't have black space on our TV. We had a little um, rescan time. 
but uh, the artifacts are completely different. Our wagon wheels did not move backwards, you know, unless we were looking at movies on TV. Um, you know, we got very nice motion blur. And, uh, and of course, you made, had a lot of fun with it, too. I had a whole chapter in the book on, on video and television that got lopped. Uh, the book's already 560 pages long, and they just said, Alvin, you got to cut something. So I cut the whole chapter on television and video, and sadly. Next Lord one. helped me a lot on that chapter, yeah. But let us know when the director's cut comes out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, where I try to discover, you know, was it Philo T. Farnsworth or, or Zvorkin that got there first? My answer was neither, but, you know, in elaborate detail. Well, uh, we're right at 11.30, and we're going to continue the session, but uh, I know some people have schedules, and so, I mean, other appointments, and so I wanted to uh, ask Jeff if you would uh, do our book raffle, and then after the raffle, we, those of you who want to stick around for a little more discussion, uh, we'll be able to do that. And so, so Jeff? Uh, so, thank you, Lauren, um, and again, thank you, Dr. Smith, that was a fantastic talk. Um, now it is your honor to pick a number between two and 27. I have uh, everyone who is in attendance today in a randomized list. And if you can give me a number, I'll call out someone's name. And if they're here, they get a book. My number is 21. 21, John Petty. Is John still here? He is not. Oh, well, too bad for John. Can we have another number, Alvi? Yes, uh, it would be 13. 13 is Benjamin Donderer. Oh, from the Reese <laughs> Congratulations, Ben. Congratulations, yeah. Ben. And, and so, uh, Ben, you have to, uh, if you could please email me with your uh, sure. shipping address, physical address. <laughs> yes. And uh, uh, Alvi has agreed to sign these books as a uh, uh, from uh, amazing. Uh, for, for Cinegrid uh, <laughs> raffle. And so uh, we'll send you a book signed by Alvy Ray Smith. Cool. <laughs> Great. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's uh, totally my topic. I We do research on that topic on OpenGL and I know a lot of this stuff from my studies. <laughs> so Congratulations. Yeah, I will definitely read it. <laughs> Anybody who needs to go, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for listening, everybody.